In the Hundred Years' War, the English used a terror tactic, a raid through enemy territory intended to intimidate and provoke the French into battle. It was called Chevauchet. The principal weapon for Chevauchet was fire. And one of the ways it was delivered was with incendiary arrows. Challenge with incendiary arrows? Keeping them alight. One type of incendiary arrow was fueled with gunpowder. You've got charcoal, got sulfur, and we've got saltpeter. Saltpeter is the main ingredient. The more oxygen you put into it, the hotter it burns. Of course, when it's on an arrow, when it's being shot, you've got a turbocharged airstream. The chemicals are bound together with brandy, left to dry and poured into a linen bag. The extra-long arrowhead is inserted into the bag and then tied off to secure it. It is then sealed by dipping it into boiling tree resin. This resin, which itself is highly flammable, provides a waterproof casing. It also shields the burning gunpowder so the wind doesn't put it out in flight. Now that looks deadly, and I really want to shoot it. The art to shooting an incendiary arrow is timing. Too early, and it will go out. Too late, it will spit at you like a dragon. That was just evil. <laughs> that was great. The word chevauchet means horse raid, and it was mobile light horsemen who spearheaded the attacks. They took gold and silver from the churches, valuables from wealthy citizens, and as much food and drink as they could find from anyone. A chevauchet was scorched earth warfare to create discontent amongst the enemy's subjects, perhaps even to get them to turn against their king. An army on campaign needed a decisive battle and a chevauchet was intended to taunt the enemy to come out and fight. The battlefields of the Hundred Years' War were full of danger. To defend against these weapons, a new type of armor was developed, plate armor. Plate armor clad the knight in an articulating exoskeleton of hardened steel. A hard outer shell that still flexes and moves with the body. It provided impressive protection and was an extraordinary technological achievement. Now one of the ways that armor gets its strength is through shape. Both of these pieces are made out of the exact same thickness as steel, but I can show you there was one stronger than the other. Here's the one with no shape. You see, it buckles immediately. If I swap it for one that's been forged to have strength and shape, you can see it's much stronger. It's going nowhere. It wasn't just the shape that gave it strength. It was also how the metal was treated by the armorer. Now, the benefits of using heat it obviously makes the piece more plastic, more ductile, lets me shape it. But the fuel also adds layers of carbon into the outer surface. This helps me increase the hardness and strength of the material. The art of the armorer was being able to judge the temperature of the metal by eye, managing the heat to create resilience in the metal. The combination of heat-treated metal and rigid shapes meant that armor didn't need to be so thick and heavy, making it much easier to fight in. But good quality plate armor did have its downside. It was very expensive. Now, not everyone could afford full steel plate armor, 
But the common man there is the brigandine. Now these are made up of overlapping steel plates that are then riveted through a textile outer. This gives you a much bigger range of movement, but is limited. It's not as strong as a full steel breastplate. That said, it is much cheaper and much easier to maintain. At its best, the armoured knight was invincible. But armour didn't just provide defence. It was also a weapon and an expression of a knight's power and prestige. Armour transformed its wearer into a work of art. A war horse was no ordinary horse. In battle, it was a knight's comrade in arms. By nature, horses are prey animals, but the war horse had to become a predator. They had to be aggressive and fearless, to charge enemy lines and to trample anyone in their way. To achieve this, they were specially bred and highly trained to fight, to lash out with their hooves on command. This meant war horses were expensive and so conveyed high status. War horses were incredibly strong and powerful, but they were also vulnerable. This is a really big target, and it's much easier to shoot a horse than it is to hit its rider. So just as men wore armor, horses wore armor too. A knight didn't ride his war horse on the road to battle. It was far too valuable. Instead, they were led by the knight's groom. A knight would take multiple war horses on campaign, as he would need to change to a fresh horse several times during battle. Once geared up, the knight, his horse, and his weapons became a highly effective system. The heavy cavalry lance had a small ring called a graper, and this locks into my arm, forming a hard linkage, so that the lance can't shoot backwards on impact. The war saddle was also crucial. With its high back, it locked the rider to the horse. This means with the graper and the saddle, Horse, man, and weapon are all locked together to create one giant horse-powered projectile. The main purpose of heavy cavalry was to charge straight into the enemy and smash through their lines. The impact charge crashed into an enemy with terrifying force. It required horses with exceptional courage and power. Longbows were powerful weapons, but keeping archers supplied with ammunition was a major undertaking. This is a modern arrow. Small and lightweight. Pretty much what everyone shoots these days. Compared to this medieval war arrow. Look at the size of this thing. It's a beast! A medieval army might need more than a million war arrows on campaign, and each one had to be made by hand. It was a labor-intensive business, and the person who did it was called a Fletcher. First, a log is split into square staves. Then the Fletcher uses a plane to start roughing out the shape. Ugh. How do I get it round? Not only have you got to make it round, you've got to make it bobtailed. Look bob at that. You see that's coming down thinner down that end. There's a natural taper coming down there to that end. A plane with a curved blade is used to create the taper. This makes the arrow aerodynamic. This is an incredibly painstaking process for one arrow. Most of them are just for one shot as well. Next, a slot is cut to receive a piece of horn. The horn reinforces the knock. That's the notch that fits the arrow to the bowstring. Without the horn insert, the power of a heavy war bow could split and shatter an arrow. Once the horn is in place, the knock is sawn and shaped. 
Then the Fletcher has to attach the feathers to the shaft. Now, what you've got to do is you've got to get rid of the stiffness of the quill. You're going to work it down so it's nice and thin. So this is dogfish skin? Yeah, medieval sandpaper. The feathers are glued in place and then secured with thread. The final process is to arm the arrow with its arrowhead. The person who makes these is called an arrowsmith. From a blank piece of iron, he starts with the part that fits over the arrow shaft. First he makes the bar flat, then uses a special former to create a socket. The final stage is to hammer out the shape of the head. Arrow stocks had to be prepared far in advance of a campaign. It was impossible to make them in sufficient numbers overnight. A medieval war arrow like this could only be shot from a big, exceptionally powerful bow. And it packed a mighty punch. A medieval army on the march was a city on the move. No expense was spared to keep knights and nobles in the lap of luxury. Knights lived in luxurious tents called pavilions, which had all of their furnishing. Proper chairs and tables and tableware, real beds with fine linens, even wall hangings. All this furniture had to be transported, and that's on top of what was needed for combat. Weapons and armor needed an army of artisans to maintain them. The armorer's job on campaign was one of maintenance, constantly repairing, knocking out dents, simply changing straps, or replacing rivets that had broken. If you think of the knight as a race car driver, the armorer is his chief mechanic. Without him, he would not be able to function. Also following an army was a band of opportunistic civilians, the camp followers, all vying to sell their services and goods to the soldiers. When on the march, most of the thousands of soldiers were mounted. Each knight would have at least six horses, all needing grooms, farriers and fodder. The royal household brought with them their clerks, their priests, essential for men who feared they might die in battle. And of course, their cooks. The common soldiers subsisted mainly on bread and a thick soup called pottage. It was an altogether different story for the knights. A knight on campaign would expect the best food. So we have game, we have fine meats, we have fruit when it's in season, always cooked, because food is tied in with health as well. That's very important. And I'm just finishing off a dish here of spiced meatballs with a red wine and pine nut sauce. French and English armies could be on campaign for months on end, manoeuvring and skirmishing until they took to the field for a decisive battle. Medieval soldiers suffered brutal injuries in battle. Their chance of survival lay with barber surgeons. From cutting hair to removing limbs on the battlefield, the job of a barber surgeon was varied, and so were their tools. 600 years ago, surgery was very different from today, and this is some of the kit that the surgeons of then would be using. For example, amputations. This bit of kit was used to cut through the skin. Then you need to get through bone, and this is what they used. Believe it or not, this was used for neurosurgery. But what they didn't have at the time was anaesthesia. Despite carrying out major surgery, barber surgeons had no formal training. 
What they learned, they learned on the job. And the place where they practiced the most was the battlefield. This was also a time when new surgical techniques were developed, particularly when it came to saving the life of a future king. In 1403, 16 year old Prince Henry was injured in the Battle of Shrewsbury while fighting rebels trying to overthrow his father, King Henry IV. The arrow penetrated his right cheek and became lodged at the base of his skull. He was very lucky it didn't kill him instantly. Prince Henry pulled the arrow from his face. The shaft came out, but the arrowhead remained lodged inside. They needed to get that out before infection set in and killed him. To the rescue, celebrated surgeon John Bradmore. Bradmore recorded what he did to save the prince's life, including a picture of the tool he made to extract the arrowhead. And it works by ensuring that the tip is closed and then inserting it along the track caused by the arrowhead until it meets the arrowhead. Then the screw is turned to expand the tip, locking it in place inside the arrowhead. And then ever so slowly and gently, you extract, making sure that you don't lose it along the way. I'm amazed by the skill that would have been needed to do this successfully. Can you imagine how good that felt when that came out? The young prince survived to become King Henry V, hero of Agincourt. But perhaps the real heroes of medieval medicine were the barber surgeons, who saved countless lives on the battlefield. During the 14th century, the face of war in Europe changed forever. Thanks to a substance invented by the Chinese, while searching for the elixir of life. Gunpowder. One of the first guns used on the battlefields of Europe was this, the Bombard. This is a large stone throwing gun for moving big projectiles like this up and over and through castle walls. Before the invention of the cannon, castle wall-busting projectiles had been thrown by trebuchets. This is what took over from the trebuchet. Far easier to move from uh, castle to castle. Its design was simplicity itself, drawing on the skills of the barrel maker. This has metal staves, lengthways, and then lots of hoops holding those staves under compression. So this is why we now call this the gun barrel as well. The bombard was no more powerful than a trebuchet, but it did have a psychological impact on the enemy. If we take it back several hundred years and the loudest thing is a cockerel crowing or a brawl in the pub on a Saturday night, these things are horrendously frightening. As metallurgy improved, barrels could be made longer, increasing accuracy and power. They progressed from taking down walls to taking out soldiers replacing the bow and arrow. A typical arrow would get stuck in this sort of material, where ball just goes straight through. So compared to a bow and arrow, this is far more deadly. During the Hundred Years' War, there was even a precursor to the machine gun, the Ribaldequin. She's got several barrels on her. This is the sort of gun that would have been very much against people being able to spread your shot out and hit large numbers of people in one go.
Gunpowder revolutionized warfare throughout the Hundred Years' War. Changing the way battles were fought forever. Before the invention of printing in the 15th century, books were painstakingly copied by hand. The finest were illuminated with brilliant colors and real gold. Illuminated text wasn't just for show. Gilded illustrations decorated important passages to highlight their significance. Gold was used in many medieval manuscripts from early days because it was very expensive and it indicated that the manuscript itself was valuable. The light would reflect from candles or from the sunlight and so it looked as though the book itself was illuminated. In medieval manuscripts, it looks as though this is solid gold. In fact, it's not. The gold itself is tissue thin. The solid appearance is achieved by laying the gold on a cushion of plaster mixed with glue, called gesso. By raising the gold from the surface of the skin, that means that it catches the light even more. The glue in the gesso is softened by breathing on it. We then have three seconds to get the gold on, and I'm using a burnisher, which is a polished stone, just to make sure that the gold sticks. Then the burnisher is used to polish the gold up. See, it's coming up now. So it's coming nice and shiny. Next, the miniature is painted. The base colour would be done first, then the tints and the shades would be added, and finally, the white highlights and the outline, which lifts it and brings the whole thing to life. The medieval paint box contained pigments from across the world, such as ultramarine from Afghanistan and orpiment gathered from volcanic craters. It often took a long time to complete these medieval miniatures, this one between a month and six weeks, from start to finish. An entire book could take a team of illuminators several years to complete. Many medieval manuscripts still survive today, fully preserved, with their colors just as vivid as the day they were illustrated. <laughs> 